commencer la réunion de FEDCO dans une minute. Merci. Uh, good morning, uh, colleagues, uh, members of the public, members of the media. Welcome to the November 1st, 2022 meeting of the Finance and Economic Development Committee, our last meeting as uh, this council. Uh, do we have quorum, Madam Coordinator? Yes, you do, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Before we proceed, I'll do a quick uh, call of all members. Conseiller Cloutier? Yeah. Councillor Curry? <clears throat> Councillor DeRuz? Councillor El Shantiri? Present. Councillor Gower? Here. Councillor Hubley? Here. <clears throat> Excuse me, Councillor Luloff? Present. See him there. Councillor Moffat? Councillor Tierney? Present. And Vice Chair Dudas? Ici. Uh, declaration of interest, Declaration de conflit d'intérêt? None. Confirmation of minutes, adoption de process verbal, FEDCO minutes 41 of June 28, 2022, process verbal 41 de CFDE, le 28 juin 2022. Adopté, carried. Adopté. Uh, presentations, uh, the LRT quarter update will be moved to uh, when we deal with all LRT items at item number 10, so we'll come back to that. Uh, finance, finance services, direction general des services des finances. Est-ce des questions ou commentaires? Questions or comment? Adopting. Uh, innovative client services department, direction générale des services d'Angleterre pour la clientèle, legal services report. The FEDCO received this report for information. Received? Received. Item 6.2, 2022 mid-year procurement uh, year in review, that FEDCO received this report. Carrie? Okay. Uh, Bureau du Greffier Municipal, uh, rapport de fin du mandat 2018-2022, Comité. City Clerk's Office. Adopté. Advisory Committee on French Language Services. Plan Carried. State and Economic Development Department, Delegation Authority, Delegation of Authority, Acquisition of Land and Property, January 1st, 2022, <clears throat> to June 30th, 2022, uh, that FEDCO received this report. Received? Received. Uh, item 8.2, Land Exchange of 529 Tremblay Road and 530 Tremblay Road with, for the first time, His Majesty the King in Right of Canada. Councillor Cloutier, I believe, has a uh, motion, and Councillor Fleury, uh, this is really Councillor Fleury's motion, as I understand it, and Councillor Fleury is uh, with us now and not able to be with us a little later, so we'll, we'll ask Councillor Cloutier to introduce it on behalf of Councillor Fleury, and then ask uh, uh, if there's lots of questions, we'll come back to it, otherwise we'll deal with it now. Councillor Fleury, Cloutier. Very Fleury. well. Merci, Monsieur le Maire. Thank you very much. And Indeed, um, this is a motion with respect to the property at 529 Trombley Road and um, where there's a plan of subdivision that will have a site plan later, but we wanted to introduce this motion with respect to uh, affordable housing and I'm doing so on behalf of Councillor Fleury. Uh, we, cir we circulated the motion this, e this morning um, with the whereases. I don't think it is necessary for me to read those, but I will absolutely put in, uh, read the therefore be it resolved that the Finance and Economic Development Committee recommend that Council direct staff to negotiate towards an, um, an I apologize. Negotiate towards an amendment to the memorandum of, of agreement to include a commitment from Canada Lands Corporation should they acquire the surplus lands for the provision that 20% of the units developed on the site are affordable housing as defined through any program under the federal national housing strategy for a minimum of 25 years, including that for affordable units. A maximum of 50% shall be one bedroom units, a minimum of 20% shall be two bedroom units, and a maximum of 25% shall be bachelor units, and a minimum of five 
percent three or more bedrooms. Um, I am agreeable to the motion and um, uh, Councillor Fleury is with us to answer any questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So Councillor Fleury, uh, with the will of committee, um, would you like to speak to this? Because I know you're not able to be here. I think you have an appointment uh, later today. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I want to thank uh, I want to thank Peter Radke as well as uh, the local councillor Jean for working with me. It's the complexities of federal lands being transferred between federal agencies. So uh, we want to make sure that the the value that the land is appraised reflects the uh, intentions of the affordable units. So we work closely with Canada Lands Corporation, Tara and her team to draft the wording of the motion. And I believe uh, uh, Peter uh, P Peter Radke from Real Estate as well as, as Tara are comfortable with the, uh, from CLC are comfortable with the wording presented today. And is staff supportive of this? Uh, who from staff is here that can comment? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Peter Radke from the Real Estate Office, and yes, we're comfortable with the uh, the direction being provided. Okay, so on the motion by Councillor Cloutier, carry. Uh, on the report nice. as amended, carry. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> item nine, City Manager's uh, uh, Office uh, update on light rail uh, transit that will go with item 10, so we'll hold that. Um, then we have one in-camera item. Uh, that we'll have to move to add it to the agenda. And um, <clears throat> I believe there is one other item where we had a delegation, if I'm not mistaken, Carol. So item 12 has a delegation, so we'll, we'll deal with that first. Uh, motion 12.1, uh, waive the disposal of real estate, real property uh, policy to transfer lands to Tartan Homes. Uh, we have a delegation by Peter Hume. Uh, who I understand uh, doesn't have to speak if it's passed. Uh, and I have a motion by Councillor Gower. Uh, Councillor Gower, would you like to introduce your motion, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, so therefore be it resolved that the Finance and Economic Development Committee replace the wording and recommendation two of item 12.1 of the revised FedCo agenda titled, Motion Waive the Disposal of Real Property Policy to Transfer Lands to Tartan Homes Limited as follows. Council to waive the disposal of real property policy to enable the city to transfer a portion of the hydro corridor to accommodate either a public or private road back to Davidson Shea Properties Incorporated for a nominal charge. And this, this motion just uh, corrects and clarifies the actual owner of the property in question that the uh, original motion dealt with, Mr. Mayor. And overall, the motion is meant to correct an error. There was uh, a small block in lands that was conveyed to the city that was not intended to be conveyed. So this motion just seeks to correct that error that was made. Okay, uh, now to our, our delegates, uh, Mr. Hume and Ms. Cote, did you have anything uh, you'd like to add? Um, I don't see Ms. Cote, Mr. Mayor, but no, uh, the councillor has outlined the, the situation appropriately. Right, thank you. Uh, so on uh, the motion by Councillor Gower, carried. Yes. On carried. the report uh, mm -hmm. as amended, carried. carried. All right. We have. Okay, so we'll go back now to item four. Uh, we have item four and item 10, and I, I'll call it 10A, all dealing with um, uh, light rail. And we have a presentation. Uh, we have Renee Amalcar and Michael Morgan. Um, I think they're here virtually with us, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, welcome, bonjour Renee. And uh, Michael, I, is Michael here? There he is. Okay, so uh, Mr. Kanalakis, do you have any opening comments uh, you'd like to make? Uh, no, I don't, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so uh, the floor is uh, yours, Renee and Michael. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Michael will uh, wrap through the, uh, the presentation. Very good. I think we have a, a video to start. So we'll start with the video if the clerks could bring that up. So your mic is a little uh, off there. Uh, Michael, is it? Are you using a regular mic? I I can switch. I'll uh, I'll switch while the uh, while the the video starts. 
Yeah, it seems quite echoey. Oops, I think your video is running now. So as you can see from the video, lots of progress on the uh, on the two lines there. I'll just uh, we'll bring up the presentation here just to give you a, a basically a blow by blow update on the construction in the various parts of the city. So uh, while that's going, I would just note in that video uh, we showed that one little section of the cut and cover tunnel. That was actually the first section of the cut of the cover being covered over. So we're topping out the the tunnel in many sections in the SGM Parkway, and so we've actually covered about 200 meters out of the 2.8 kilometers that we need to do. So uh, still lots more tunnel to build, but we are we are making progress. So we'll go right into the second slide, which is just a, just a reminder of all the things that uh, stage two is bringing, uh, bringing 77% of Ottawa residents within five kilometers of light rail, creating a thousand full-time jobs, uh, the system being capable of carrying up to 24,000 customers per hour per direction during peaks at, during the ultimate build out, uh, adding more than 900, replacing more than 900,000 annual rush hour bus trips and reducing up to 110,000 tons of GHGs by the year 2048. So lots of, uh, lots of changes, lots of benefits coming with the project. Um, we focus a lot on the, the construction progress. So if you go to the next slide, just show you just as a reminder of the renderings, which are available on the stage two website. So this is a shot of Moody Station at the end of the line where we're adding a new bus loop. Uh, and this is where the connections will come from Canada in the future and other local routes. So this is, uh, as you drive by this area now, you can really see the elevator banks and other elements coming out of the ground very quickly. So a lot of progress at this site. If you go to the next slide. So in terms of 2022, uh, 
general progress. By the end of the year, we'll have construction started at all the stations across the entire line. The last couple of stations to come online are Kitchissippi uh, and Westboro. So Kitchissippi is continuing to do excavation at that location. Rail extension uh, or the rail installation on the O-Train East extension, you can see a ton of rail now down in that area. Cut and cover, I pointed out that small section of the cut and cover tunnel that's been covered. The Stadler Flirt vehicles are coming. Uh, the Awesome Citizens vehicles are still being manufactured and delivered to site. And by the end of the year, there'll be seven of the 11 pedestrian bridges that we'll be building will be in place, set in place, not open for service, but uh, certainly available uh, to show progress on those points. So go and give the general uh, construction updates on the next slide. I'll go through this uh, quite quickly. So starting in the east, um, so this was, uh, there's a couple of before and after shots in here. So here you see the, the before in 2020 uh, with the old transitway structure there. We saw in the video that it getting torn down earlier this year and obviously the flyover is in place now and that that road is pretty in pretty good shape if you go to the next slide you see the the new flyover that's uh, that will be taking the trains to the center track and so a lot of progress here um, we've basically stabilized construction through this area uh, now a lot of the effort is on the bridge itself building uh, putting the track in place and then close to player doing the tie-ins so if you go to the next slide Uh, so Montreal Station, so a lot of work uh, was done the last couple of years to make this space available to build the station. Um, this is the view from up top, and so you see the two elevator banks at either end of the platform, which are providing the access from Montreal Road. Uh, still doing tidy up, still doing work on Montreal Road itself. There's still some utility work to do, but the station is coming out of the ground nicely. We're trying to get all the electrical rooms in place so we can start doing uh, communication system and signal system installation uh, next year. Go to the next slide. Greens Creek Pedestrian Bridge. So this was dropped in uh, earlier in the year. So this is still uh, being worked on. The pathway that connects here all the way back to Blair. Uh, it's a lot of construction in, uh, taking place to make, make that pathway uh, from Blair to this location. Uh, but it is exciting progress here to see this bridge in place. So if we go to the next slide. So this is again a before shot of Jean d'Arc Station. Jean d'Arc is in the east as one of those stations where you drive by. Um, it's really amazing to see the great progress that they've been making there. So if you go to the next slide, it shows you Jean d'Arc coming out of the ground and they're, they're onto glazing now. They're, they've wrapped some of the maintenance buildings there um, with the tiles. So looking very good. They're going to uh, try to get that signal room. There's a signal room in the small building kind of at the lower end of the screen. They want to get the signal room built so that they can start uh, commissioning the signal system that connects to the turnouts that's just, uh, just to the west of here. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, Convent Glen. So Convent Glen Station is a little bit further behind, but it's uh, this is a slightly older photo. It is coming out of the ground quickly now. We had uh, a couple of delays at this location with the uh, sewer bypass, but it's back on. It's not quite back on track, but they'll be able to catch up over the coming months in this area. Go to the next slide, please. Last Orlean Station. So you see there's kind of there's two structures here, the one on the left, which is the access for pedestrians, people coming from Champlain Bridge, and then the one on the right connecting to the original pedestrian bridge, and then connecting to the new pedestrian bridge, which is going to enable people to transfer the, <clears throat> from the bus without having to go through a, a turnstile or fare gate, so you'll be able to transfer directly from here to the train, and then there is a one long escalator going from uh, the structure on the right down to platform level, because that is quite uh, quite a grade separation there elevation change at that location. If you go to the next slide, you'll show a slightly close up picture of this new pedestrian bridge that we're going in place. <clears throat> so there's a bunch of rework that we need to do with the bus loop to enable the, uh, the transfer and the, the ease of transfer at this location without having to go through a fare gate. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, this provides a significant uh, significant extra capacity for people coming and going uh, from the LRT station and the bus loop, uh, in addition to the, the red pedestrian bridge there, which is the free flowing pedestrian bridge to get to the mall. Go to the next slide. So rail installation, <clears throat> so making very good progress, basically from here all the way through. So this is just to the one side of Jean d'Arc. You see there's a turnout set of crossovers there. 
so through this area, uh, you can actually see all the overhead catenary poles have been installed as well. So they are looking at stringing catenary wire uh, in the spring, and that will enable us to be able to start doing train movements in this area roughly end of summer, fall next year. So uh, very good progress. And this is <clears throat> this area is looking very kind of neat and tidy. They've cleaned it up. There's still some final paving to do at the end of the project, but making very good progress with the rail in the east. Go to the next slide, please. So trim station. So just uh, so it's a little difficult to make out, um, but just in there's kind of one dark gray uh, honey pole that's kind of in just to the right of the page, um, and then just to the left of that there's a couple of pier caps that you can see, or which are for the uh, pedestrian bridge that will take you to the LRT station. And so we're going to have to do a closure of uh, the OR174 at this location uh, to to be able to drop that that bridge in place and then we'll have a pedestrian bridge basically dropping down to a, a new uh, building entryway with the fare gates in the bus loop. Uh, and again, this, this location will have, uh, you know, free access or not free access, but free flowing access um, for buses that drop passengers off. And there will also be a set of fare gates for people coming in off the street. So that pedestrian bridge will drop people into the, uh, into the LRT station at this location. Go to the next slide, please. So the upcoming activities, so as I mentioned, the, the PED bridge, progress on all five stations, completion of rail installation, and then next year we are expecting to see our first train movements uh, in this area. So that's a very exciting uh, milestone for the team when you'll see, uh, see the train in the middle of the 174 next year. So uh, very excited about that. If you go to the next slide. Just in terms of the project, uh, what we're seeing. So the latest update from from the team is that they are 36 days off the original uh, schedule so they pushed it to January 1st. Um, that being said, the end of the schedule uh, has some some float in it and there's some opportunity to discuss uh, with the, the builder what the handover process looks like. So we're doing that now trying to recover those days, <clears throat> but generally the east is still on schedule. Go to the next slide. And then just finally, the mobility impacts in this area. So, um, so weekend closure for that, putting that trim pedestrian bridge in, um, still, you know, a variety of lane closures kind of on and off some late night stuff. And then Montreal Road, there's some more utility works that need to be done at the station and in on Montreal Road. So <clears throat> still, still some remaining impacts on the highway, but, but generally not like what we saw a year ago in terms of the super weekends and the, the continuous, uh, continuous activity. Next slide, please. Talk about the West. So just starting uh, near Tunney's Pasture. So this is, you can see, this is the old transit way. It's already been uh, excavated. So they're in there now doing utility works. There's a big box culvert that needs some repairs. Um, so they're gonna do that work. There's a bit of a ramp down here to get into the guideway to, uh, to start that retrofit work and make that connection to Tunney's. Go to the next slide. This is Kitchissippi Station. So you see this is a bit of a, a wet site at the moment, but there is rock excavation here where we need to uh, basically change the direction of the current rock cut to make and to make space for the station. Uh, and so the rock excavation in this area is expected to last at least through January. Uh, so there's a bit more work to be done to, to make space for the new station. Obviously there's drainage and other things that need to be done here uh, before they start the station in earnest. We go to the next slide. Show you the next couple. Show you some photos of the uh, the S jam cut and cover. And so we are starting to uh, put the cover on the tunnel. Uh, they are using a series of they're called Ever Everest Travelers, which is basically a, a movable form uh, that they slide slide in place, pour the concrete, let it cure, then they move the the form down. So they've got three of those, and then they've got uh, a fourth peri form. So they are they are trying to to really make as much progress on this tunnel as possible. If you go to the next slide see a shot of uh, of the tunnel kind of getting closer to to the homes and then just on just kind of hidden behind the uh, the header there is actually where this is where we cross the road to get into richmond and so there's been a lot of discussion about that area it's a very sensitive area the tunnels are being built over the west Nepean, uh collector so there's a lot of kind of sensitivities with that final connection across um, across the road into the station location. Um, a, a lot of work at this location, uh, the, the SJAM in its entirety and doing pretty well so far to, uh, to keep the water out of that tunnel, but you see how close we are there to the river. 
we go to the next one. I believe it's uh, there's a oh okay. So here's here's the road connection <clears throat> uh, where we need to cut across the road, and so this is a this is a tough spot because there's a lot of big utilities here, and we're over that West Nepean collector. And so what you see at the just in the middle of the page there, they're starting to put together that uh, Everest form uh, to be able to build the tunnel. So they are making progress. They are kind of moving on multiple fronts, but there st are still a lot of challenges and sensitive areas to get through on this cut and cover tunnel. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, here's a again a before of uh, Byron Linear Park in 2020, and then it's not in the exact same location. But the next slide shows you a bit of a, the after condition. <clears throat> so you see the uh, the orange formwork at the bottom there is where uh, we're building tall walls for the station. So those have to have an architectural finish. And then in the distance, uh, as the you move kind of up towards the top of the page, there you see the formwork come into play, where and the and the, the guideway narrows because it goes from the station location narrows to the just the tunnel location so a lot of work in this location a lot of activity a lot of you know doing each one of those you see that orange formwork on the bottom left doing one of those pours takes about 12 hours and so there's a lot to do there's a lot of we you know on a regular basis we're having to uh, park concrete delivery trucks and pumper trucks on byron road to uh, to build those walls if you go to the next slide please so here you see more of the covered section. Uh, and so part of this, we do need some of the space for detours to kind of make more space, but, uh, but they are working quickly to try to get across here. And uh, I don't have a date on when the backfilling will start, but certainly that'll be a big, uh, you see there's kind of at the top of the page, there's a bit of a plug where, where there's a road access. And so what they'll do is they'll shift that road access to over the tunnel uh, so they can finish off that section of tunnel. So they'll do that progressively as they move through the tunnel area. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, and then this is just a close up of the uh, the formwork after the fact. Once you you see how that you get a very good finish on the the concrete there with the Everest Everest uh, form system. So good progress there. And as I said, roughly two hundred meters of of the two point eight or twenty eight hundred meters has been completed to date. So next year is going to be a big year to uh, to to make progress on this. And they are going to work on this these sections over the winter. So they're going to do as much as they can. Uh, they, they've come up with a temporary tent structure that they're going to move along the guideway to essentially help them continue the progress of this work during winter. Do you go to the next slide, please? So New Orchard Station. So again, just kind of a, a shot from the, the ground level. You see those uh, big panels that they use for making the walls of the station. Uh, and then you see a bit of an architectural structure coming across through the middle of the station. So there'll be some struts that, that connect the two stations and a bit of a feature there. Go to the next slide, please. So here's the before Lincoln Fields. And so you see the uh, the magnitude of the, the bus loop in this area. Um, you see the original kind of transit way pedestrian bridge there so there's been a lot of uh, shifting around uh, you know we certainly appreciate customers patience uh, and accommodating all the changes we've had to make a number of changes and it there there's probably more to come we're adding a new ramp to get buses down to the lo new lower loop we'll show you on the next page the current status of this location Um, so you see just at the bottom of the page on the left, we've built a new bus, temporary bus loop. You see the old pedestrian bridge from the transitway coming apart. Um, you see right now buses are kind of navigating across on the top left where the guideway is going to run. And so we're actually going to have to detour the buses uh, using a new ramp uh, to stay away from that area as we build the guideway basically on this page left to right. And then on the right hand side, Carling uh, Road, we've had to re put in a new bridge and uh, build a structure to make space under the tunnel for the LRT at this location. So we go to the next slide, please. Just another shot of Lincoln Field Station. Here you can see the new bridge on Carling Avenue where we've created the space for the LRT to go underneath. Uh, and the, on the right hand side is where the temporary bus loop is. And then in the end state, the bus loop is actually on the left of the screen. And so where those trailers are parked, that's where the ultimate configuration is going to be. Go to the next slide. Carling Avenue Bridge there. So we are uh, making space and we are reallocating some of the, the sidewalk space to the system to make it as uh, friendly as possible to get to the station. If you go to the next slide, please. 
uh, just a little bit further uh, down the line. So you see Lincoln Fields flyover. Uh, and then in the distance, you see the Woodruff pedestrian bridge there. So a lot of work happening in this area. We are keeping the transitway in this area open as long as possible. So the transitway will stay open uh, and will be uh, maintained in parallel uh, with the new LRT guideway that we're building that goes up to Iris. Uh, but a lot of activity, uh, and we need to basically make the connection through this location back to Lincoln Fields. That's where you're, you have a three-track station, and that's where the trains split. Trains will go south to Algonquin, and then trains will go uh, the other direction to Moody. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this is Iris Station area uh, in 2020. So this is, uh, again, a lot of utility work. There's a Pinecrest Creek in this location, uh, which we had to redirect. Uh, and then we had to, new to build a new road bridge to, um, to get over the LRT. So on the next slide, you see that we made good progress on the road bridge. <clears throat> uh, so there's, there's the new road bridge that's gonna go over the LRT. You see Iris Station there kind of on either side of the guideway. Uh, on the right, lower right hand side, you see where we've detoured the transitway. And so that transitway will stay in service until we put the LRT into service. And once LRT is into service, then we'll come back and we'll decommission that roadway and we'll finish uh, the work on Pinecrest Creek. You see it's in a realigned location just on the right hand side there, but still kind of a lot of staging in this area. We have to come back after the fact to, uh, to clean it up and finish the landscaping. So lots more work to, to come in this area, but the, uh, the station is coming out of the ground very, very nicely now. Go to the next slide. Pinecrest uh, Storm Water Management Pond. So another kind of one of the bundled projects with uh, with this activity. So this is all about you know tempering the flows uh, to Pinecrest Creek. It's all part of an integrated strategy to improve the uh, the quality and health of of that creek. And so a lot of work here, but still um, still more to come before this is finished and put into service. To go to the next slide, please. Algonquin Station. So you see on the right is the uh, there's a pier there where the new pedestrian bridge is going to provide a direct connection from the uh, from Algonquin into the station. Uh, the station's coming together very nicely. Again, there'll be a bus loop connections here. This is one of two buildings that's being built, and then the station at this location is underground. Go to the next station slide, please. So. Switching from Algonquin Station, uh, which is kind of the southern leg, back over to the, the leg that's running to the west, Queensview Station here. So this is what you can actually see on the right-hand side in the middle of the page. There's a bit of a uh, green area. That's the where a footing is going to be poured. So we're putting in a pedestrian bridge over the highway at this location so people on the one side can get to Queensview. Um, and then the top left hiding behind the banner is the the uh, existing Pinecrest bus garage. So we are doing a lot in this area to try to improve the connectivity, uh, but this is providing a good access point to the, the businesses in this area and the homes in this area. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So Pinecrest Station, so this is the location before. And so it's uh, some of the changes are subtle uh, in the after, but we've adjusted basically all the ramps, we've closed the ramps on the bottom, uh, looking to reopen those next year. There is a new bus only ramp. So on the next slide, you'll see the, uh, the progress on the station. So we've moved ramps out of the way to make space for the station. We've created a, a bridge structure that we pushed in place last year. I'll just wait for the next slide to come up. There you go. So, uh, so the structure, so you see the one ramp there uh, with the blacker looking pavement to, was rebuilt. And then the, the Pinecrest station there, uh, it's coming together. The struts that, those struts that go across the two walls are permanent. Uh, and then there'll be a little bit of a bus loop just, uh, just on the kind of the upper location of the page. And then off the screen is all the, uh, the new ramps that we're rebuilding uh, to, to make space for the LRT. If you go to the next station, uh, slide, please. Uh, Bayshore Station. So this is where you know we basically have access to the guideway here. We're repurposing the, as much of the building as possible to make way for uh, the new LRT. And then you see a bit of a bus loop. There's been a lot of changes in this area to accommodate the the, the buses and to to deal with the temporary bus loop configurations. Go to the next slide, please. So Moody Station. So if you drive past this area, the one, the, those two uh, elevator banks, which is the street steel structures, really pop out at you. Uh, it feels pretty close to the highway, but we've uh, 
we've basically squeezed it in between uh, the highway on one side and NCC lands on the other. So it's a, it's a tight spot, but it's a, a good location. And this is, I showed you the rendering at the start of this presentation for what this will look like in the end state. So um, this, this location is coming together nicely. So you go to the next slide. So Moody Interchange, again, another location where we had to rebuild uh, all the interchange ramps to make space and uh, for the LRT to go under the structure. If you go to the next slide. couple of slides here on the maintenance facility. So we're starting to see the maintenance facility stabilize in terms of the work that's being done. It is still on schedule. The original schedule was for them to hand over in 2023 so that we could use it for additional vehicles. And we are working with uh, Kiwit Eurovia Vinci to come up with a plan to deliver vehicles here. Uh, so to enable early testing, but also to uh, just in terms of a space issue to provide more capacity at Belfast just to move trains around. So good progress on this uh, on this site and still still scheduled for handover in 2023. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so what you're seeing kind of in the middle is the uh, there's a very large substation that we have to put at this location to provide the power to the station nearby station as well as to the yard. So a lot of electrical activity that needs to be done over the coming year to, to get this into service. Go to the next slide, please. And then just a shot from up above. Next slide, please. Um, so the big, uh, I would say one of the big milestones in the West was uh, delivering the rail. And so we are actually going to start seeing rail go down in the yard and in that section between Bayshore and Moody Drive uh, fairly quickly here. So all the catenary pole bases have um, have been uh, poured and are ready to go. Uh, once they have the rail in place, then that's when the team will come back and start doing work on the catenary. But a uh, big milestone with getting rail delivered to the West in this photo. Go to the next slide, please. So just uh, some upcoming construction activities. So construction on all stations, excavation covering cut and cover tunnels will continue. So that's that's the big challenge right now is the productivity levels uh, on the cut and cover tunnel have not achieved what we need to to maintain schedule. And so I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then the LMSF buildings, uh, basically getting them closed up for the winter so that the interior commissioning can happen and the handover can happen for 2023. So LMSF certainly being a, a success story on the on the West for us with this project. If you go to the next slide. <clears throat> so one of the challenges uh, on the West project is uh, really the product production levels that we see uh, to build the tunnel, the availability of concrete, the availability of rebar, the availability of uh, waterproofing material has impacted the project. Uh, there is a shortage of resources to be able to build the project. So they're struggling to, to maintain the schedule in this area. We're seeing a delay of 17 months in the West. Um, there is still you know, some discussions to be had um, with, the, uh, with the consortium to understand how much that can be brought back next year and what opportunities exist at the end of the project during the commissioning process to, to take some of the lessons learned from the East and apply them to the West to be able to catch up some of that time. So we are in delay in the West, still on schedule in the East, uh, but just wanted to give you that, that update on the project schedule. So we go to the next slide. So the West, there's a, there are still a series of uh, mobility impacts and uh, roadway impacts. Some of these are kind of permanent now, where, for example, the first one, Dominion to Tunnies, we've, we've pushed all the traffic onto Scott. Uh, Richmond Road, we're doing a, an Ambleside detour through, through next year. So we're looking at the timing of that and how much we can maximize the, the benefit of that. And then Richmond Road, just with all the staging, uh, you know, we've had to, on a regular basis, do flagging, different things to get people through. And then Woodruff, there is a bit of a closure required next year to finish off the road uh, over the tunnel. So we go to the next one. There's uh, an another list of some impacts. So Carling Avenue. So we're finishing off the uh, the bridge there, uh, hoping to kind of reinstate traffic to a normal condition. Transway, that's essentially a Pinecrest to Bayshore, a permanent closure now that we've handed that over to Guideway. Uh, the Highway 417 and Pinecrest interchange. And so that westbound off-ramp is still closed to traffic. And we are uh, working closely with Kev to understand when that will open. But I think they are seeing a couple of months. Originally, they were hoping for spring, but now it looks like it's going to be through the summer. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, there's some some work to be done 
uh, to get the pedestrian bridge in place at Queensview and some other things. So there would be some additional closures uh, that we need to do uh, on weekends to get additional work completed. Let's go to the next slide. To just talk, the next slide talks about the, the segment Algonquin. So obviously that uh, <clears throat> iris to, to baseline, we've closed that. Uh, Lincoln Fields to iris, we're maintaining that uh, in place. Um, Woodruff Pedestrian Ridge, we are looking to get this back in place and open that up in the spring of 2023. We ran into some challenges with utility works in that location. And then uh, Corksdown, uh, there are some impacts on the station construction on Corksdown Road. And so we're gonna have to reduce for a period uh, to a single direction. So, but again, that's just temporary. The final state, final condition for Corksdown Road is a two-way condition. Go to the next slide. Uh, and then in parallel with the project that Kev is doing, uh, we are still producing more citizen vehicles and nine have been accepted. There's four that are in final testing, final inspection. And so uh, that's going to bring us to a number 13, obviously, simple math. And then uh, we're expecting a couple more and then we'll be in a good shape, shape in terms of fleet size for the east opening uh, and the additional vehicles won't be required until we open the west. And so that we are in, in good shape there in terms of the fleet size. Obviously, uh, the transit team is still following up on some of the stage one issues to make sure those are all cleaned up in time for stage two. Let's go to the next slide. So we'll talk about the O train south right up Bayview. So this is uh, so this is now feels like an old photo, but it's a, a recent photo of the progress at the station. You see the the structure in the middle there with the kind of the the green edge on the roof. So that's actually. Uh, and then on the right hand side, there's a pier cap. So we're actually putting in a pedestrian bridge that will connect to the future uh, tower at that location. So that's being installed shortly. Track is being installed through this area. Uh, you see the turnouts, you see the double, uh, double platform at this location. So a lot of progress at Bayview Station. If you go to the next station, Corso Italia on the next slide. Uh, oh, so here's the, here's the, the, the track work that's being installed at Bayview. So you go by there, it's uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of activity. And in general, the, the strategy with track is they need to get the track completed um, all across the entire Trillium line this year uh, to enable testing and the overall program uh, next spring. And so they are, I checked in with the team on Monday, they're at about 65% completion of track across the alignment. Much of the track you can't see because it's uh, often in areas that are inaccessible uh, by road, but uh, they are about 65% and they are looking to, to finish that all up uh, this year. If you go to the next slide. So this is the before of Corso Italia. So a couple of years ago, we were just doing, getting, uh, getting set up to do the, uh, the excavation in this area. And then if you go to the next slide, you see the current progress. Uh, so this is, a, this is a few weeks ago. So they're starting to stage track through this area. On the bottom of the page, you see the additional emergency exits. On the, the top of the page, you see the, the plaza area that's being built that's connecting to Gladstone. Uh, and then you see the platform that's being built up. And then, you know, left and right of this new building. So left is OCH development, right is uh, there's development application in to turn that existing building into towers. And so there's going to be a lot of people living, living around this area, which will be very exciting for, this, uh, for them to have a new station. So go to the next slide. So Dow's Lake Station, so on the right-hand side, you see they've already wrapped the elevator bank uh, for winter to be able to work on the elevators. So we're putting in a redundant elevator bank for winter. So they've wrapped that. They're starting to uh, bring track through this area. So they are, are making good progress on this station. Go to the next one. Carling Station, or sorry, Carlton Station. Uh, so one of the things you'll notice there is the, uh, the, the yellow barrier on the edge of the platform, uh, which is uh, we used to have platform extenders that were kind of intermittent on the original system. So now we've done a platform extender that's the full length. But when you see those platform extenders, it basically shows that the, the platform is almost finished. They've actually put down a thin plywood material to protect the surface of the platform while they finish construction. But the fencing's going up, the, uh, the platform uh, Transit shelters are going up, so this is this is coming along nicely, and they're expecting to get tracked through this area shortly if this, if they haven't started already. If you go to the next slide, please. So just another view there. So you see the again that platform edge extender, and down the middle is where there's going to be an inner track barrier. Um, but they're generally just at, they're at the point now where all the they're into the finishings, the electrical work at this location. So uh, good progress at Carlton. Next slide, please. 
So a couple <clears throat> couple big things going on here. Obviously, the Rideau River pedestrian bridge was dropped in place. It required a very large crane that had to be rescheduled following the operator strike for that uh, structure. And then in the middle, so this is where they're starting to demobilize now at this location and take down all the scaffolding. But that's the you know the ori original. Uh, train bridge, which is being essentially been rehabilitated to give it 30 years more of life, will be rehabilitated at the end of the project as well. But uh, a lot of work done to that bridge and that structure, especially on the southern side, the pier required a, a ton of extra work. So kudos to TNEX and their engineers for doing repairs and getting that in working order. So still a lot of activity in this location. A lot of questions about that uh, pedestrian bridge. I know there's a lot of excitement about that. Uh, but at this point, it is uh, going to be next year before it opens. If you go to the next slide. So Mooney's base station. So again, this station is pretty advanced. You see the that plywood that's down on the platform is meant to protect the, the surface of the, the station. So they are making good progress and they are bringing track through here pretty quickly. If you go to the next slide. Uh, Elwood Diamond. So this is the grade separation over a via. Uh, so they've been making very good progress here. They are looking at uh, reinstating the original multi-use pathway on the southern side. Uh, I think they're actively working on it now. I don't know when it will reopen, but uh, the, a lot of inter, kind of interfaces uh, between the via rail, between the transitway, between the creek, between the multi-use pathways in this area, but they have made good progress on this bridge. Uh, and they this is the type of thing they can actually bring the rail onto the structure over winter. And so that's what they may do. Go to the next slide, please. So Walkley Station, again, you see that yellow, uh, uh, yellow platform ex edge extender in there. See they're tarping up some of the elevator banks there to, to allow us to work on them through winter, um, but getting to a pretty good state here. Um, on the right-hand side, you kind of see the beginnings of the multi-use pathway that will go up to Walkley Road. And then we have spoken to uh, the planning department and the, the there's a private connection through to bank from just kind of the middle of the page. And that's uh, scheduled for 2023 now uh, being done through the, through the local developer that put up the new rental building just on the right there. So you go to the next slide. So the MSF, so there's a couple of photos here. So we're making uh, good progress in terms of the MSF. I believe the gas connection is all done now so they can start uh, final commissioning all the, on all the systems uh, ahead of getting occupancy. So this is kind of the, uh, the primary maintenance building for the heavy maintenance as well as the light maintenance. Uh, there's an administrative building on the left. The next, I believe there's a second photo. If you go to the next slide, um, <clears throat> which shows a train inspection building. So there is actually quite an increase in capacity here. Uh, so we've got the two full bays in the maintenance building, and then we've got the two full bays in the train inspection building. This building is what they'll be using for washing the vehicles, refueling, resanding, all of those things, cleaning the vehicles, making sure they're ready for the next day. So um, a lot of extra maintenance capacity at this facility now that we've done the expansion. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, guideway progress. So I spoke about it briefly. So this is just a shot looking south. This is where the track kind of disappears into the forest and you can't follow its progress. But from here it goes, uh, we created a test track down to Leitrim. Uh, there is track all the way through. Uh, uh, I mean, it's through to Leitrim and beyond. Um, there's some small gaps by uh, Lime Bank and a couple other spots, but you also see kind of the, where the vehicles will turn off to go to the airport on the right here. So a lot of activity at this location. Or, a lot of progress here. Uh, just fine. We just need the final connection across Hunt Club to, to really close the gap there. Let's go to the next one. The so Greenboro Station. So this one's in pretty good shape. I think it's like at 80 or 90 percent. Again, we're just uh, finishing up. There are some glass barriers at this location with the bird friendly glass uh, and uh, just to provide a little bit of shelter because this location is a little bit exposed. If you go to the next station, next slide rather. So South Key Station. So you kind of, you start to see at the bottom of the screen, you see the bit of a three, three track structure for the passing movements for the, the airport train to come in and out. Um, this station is, is coming along nicely. And again, they're using some tarping to be able to kind of work on the elevators over winter. Go to the next slide, please. Leitrim Station. So here you see the track. The track is through on both sides now, uh, and they are enclosing this, uh, starting to put glazing up. And so a lot, a lot of good progress at this location as well. And obviously there's all the, the bus loop reconfiguration that needs to be done next summer ahead of opening. Go to the next slide, please. 
Bozeville Station, so much further to the south. So again, wrapping, you see the wrapping there to be able to work on the elevators during winter. Uh, you see, you know, the structures come up pretty well, the bus operator building on the kind of the left middle, and then the fare gate entrance in the uh, the, the bottom left there uh, quadrant. So it's coming together nicely. This station's pretty advanced actually. Go to the next slide. Lime Bank Station, the before. So this is a couple years ago now. And then if you go quickly to the, uh, the current photo, you'll see it's, uh, this is actually a, a little while ago, they're doing the waterproofing on the decking. They're gonna bring the ballast through. They've got the elevators wrapped so they can work on those through winter. Uh, and this is kind of one of the last segments of track in the south that needs to be done between here through to roughly um, Mosquito Creek. Uh, but they, they'll be able to get on that quickly now that the, I believe the waterproofing is complete on the structure. Go to the next slide. Flip over to the, uh, to the airport link, Upland Station. Uh, good progress here. So this is kind of one of the, just on the top of the page is where the airport trains from the airport parkway come through Upland Station. And then just kind of behind us on this page is where the link to the airport is. So this is kind of one of those, uh, again, another gap in the track, but it's one of those areas that they're gonna fill in quickly um, now that uh, they've advanced the station works. So we go to the next slide. You'll see the final approach to the airport on this slide and the plinths, the concrete plinths. So the rail will actually be mounted on those plinths. The train will stop at this location. There's a platform on the left and then it connects to the plaza building that's that the airport has constructed. So, um, you know, they're in pretty good shape here to be able to come and uh, get the rail in pretty quickly uh, over the coming, coming months. Go to the next slide, please. So just in terms of uh, updates, and so I think I got a text from someone this morning and uh, planning talking about this, uh, the Trinity Pedestrian Bridge. I don't know if, it was if it's going to still be called the Trinity Pedestrian Bridge, but the Pedestrian Bridge at Bayview Station uh, is going in shortly. We should see that go in. Station and bridge construction completion. So all the bridges, uh, Hunt Club is really the last one that needs a little bit of attention. Uh, track across the network. Again, we're at about 65% uh, installed of track work and then continued Stadler vehicle testing commissioning. So those vehicles have been here for a while now uh, and we've been uh, doing doing as much as we can. The, the, real, the next real big milestone for those vehicles is to be able to run them north and south across the line. If you go to the next slide. So we are, uh, <clears throat> in terms of the schedule for the Trillium line, uh, we have been working closely with TNACs to understand you know, what the opportunities are to, to bring the schedule back. Right now, we're looking at a handover in August uh, 2023 and then potentially putting it into service in September. Um, so that's the current date. But really, it was about uh, sliding out of the commissioning um, trial running. But, you know, I'll link the, the main driver on this page is the completion of the guideway, which once that is done, once the track is in place, that basically unlocks a lot of the testing and commissioning activities. We've been doing a lot of concurrent commissioning activities, trying to do early testing of the signal system, early testing of the SCADA systems, all to enable a, a, uh, a quick handover once it's done. But you know, if we can get the track completed this year, then that sets us up well for starting the Siemens signal testing in the spring and sets us up well for a, for a potential August handover to the city. So that's what we're working on with the, uh, the Trillium line schedule. In terms of mobility impacts, I believe there's a slide on that. Um, so still, you know, the biggest thing being a few of these MUPs, there's a, a variety of closures uh, at a couple of few different locations that we're working on. So I think these ones are fairly well known. If you go to the next slide. Uh, some, you know, some additional work here. Um, the MUP at Carling, uh, there is a, to connect the utilities to the station at location, there's a, has a pretty big impact at the MUP right at that location. Hunt Club, there's gonna be some kind of on and off closures required to, to finish that up. Earl Armstrong Road and Bozo Road, this is where we're realigning the road to take out, there's that funny jog. So we're realigning the road to put in the traffic lights. Um, so that's gonna have some impacts uh, to, to do that work. Then Carling Avenue, to get the utilities to the location requires some impacts. And then the, the Trillium Line MUP at Carling or at Dow's Lake uh, has some big impacts because of the utility connections. So still, still trying to close those out as much as possible. Go to the next slide. So Stadler flirts. So there's just, uh, you know, 
all seven vehicles are, are now on site. They've all been inspected. Um, city team is very happy with what they're seeing in terms of the performance. I think the operators are quite happy with them as well. So those are all staged now at uh, at Walkway Yard with along with the existing six Halston lints. Um, so we have the full fleet for the trillion line here ready to go. And then I think the next slide is just the last one, which just kind of wraps up the uh, the completion dates and where we are. So south extension uh, targeting that. August, September timeline, O-Train East extension still on for end of 2024, and then O-Train West extension uh, now pushing into late 2026. So that's the, the end of my presentation, Mr. Mayor. Happy to, to answer questions and uh, if there are any. Great, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Morgan. Uh, just a couple of uh, points. One, with respect to um, some of the reasons for delays, I'm assuming it's uh, supply chain issues, labor issues. Could you give us a little breakdown in terms of what, I know this may be difficult to pin down to a number, but what percent of the delays are as a result of labor issues, not being able to get people on site because of COVID and so on, and then supply chain issues. You know, is there something specifically with like, for instance, the you know the, the rail uh, lines themselves coming from, I think, Spain, is that slowed things down on on the uh, mostly the west because east is in pretty good shape and south is uh, um, not as bad as the west thank you yeah i yeah in terms of uh you know generally in ontario right now there is uh, you know we're seeing a lot of projects in delay we're seeing a lot of pressure on uh the availability of craft to actually undertake the work. So this is people who are doing rebar, people who are pouring concrete, people who are kind of building stations. And so that's uh, because we're building a cut and cover uh, through the West that has a big impact on the, the timelines for the project. And then there has been some, some challenges. There is a, a, a shortage of cement in North America at the moment. Um, and so that's obviously affecting concrete production. Uh, they've had some challenges with rebar. They've had some challenges with the waterproofing. So it's hard to pinpoint a percentage, um, but it's basically a breakdown between uh, some material issues, uh, supply issues, rebar, concrete, waterproofing, uh, craft issues, things like rail. So we the rail was ordered early. And as I showed you the photo, it's been delivered um, uh, to the West to be able to start that work. but. But I would say everything in the supply chain, the, the teams have had to work very hard at managing those. So, you know, for example, concrete ties, uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussions back and forth with the manufacturers in Maryland to get access to those ties because there are a lot of projects that are, that are pulling on, putting pressure on that factory to provide those. So um, big impacts across the board. Uh, you know, I think it's affecting, you, you know, utilities, uh, have the same impacts. There's been a number of impacts this year, strikes. Uh, the big storm had some impacts in terms of availability of Hydro Ottawa. Uh, even the things like the trucker convoy had impacts in terms of not being able to do, uh, make changes to signal system or sorry, traffic signals because you know of the unavailability of police officers. So this was a difficult year in terms of like the first six months. So there being a number of uh, real impacts that, that had to get worked through and then piling on the, just the supply issues, having to work on those every day to make sure that they don't impact or slow down the project. Great, thank you. And just to, as an aside, you referred to the Algonquin station as Algonquin. Did we change that name? Because I know Algonquin College would like it changed to Algonquin. I, I believe we did, sir. Okay, Mr. thank you. Uh, Councillor Cavanaugh, and congratulations on your reelection. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, um, I just want to say uh, thank you, first of all, to, to Michael and his team uh, for uh, constant communication. Um, it's a huge impact on Bay Ward with uh, seven stations and actually Kitchissippi's just on the edge, so uh, almost eight. Um, um, and um, it, it's a lot of work. Um, with all these delays, one of the concerns of re residents, because it's... Um, the, these residents are the closest to the to the work as as we saw um, in the east uh, it's going down a highway it's not near residents um, in Bay Ward it's very much uh, practically in people's backyards um, and I'm concerned about overnight work um, if it's going to increase because of course that's been a, a huge issue um, this is not just a project for a year or two years it's three years it's four years it's a huge impact on people's mental health and um, want to know um, how that's going to be controlled and and, uh, 
and keeping consideration of the residents of the area. <clears throat> yes, absolutely, Ms. So, Mr. Mayor, the, the construction of the tunnel uh, as we start to close it up and we force eventually once we are kind of hit a critical mass of that work, the work will be forced inside. And so I think as a result, we'll have the benefit of being able to do uh, all the electrical work, the rail work, all of that kind of in, in an indoor space that will help uh, restrict the noise and the impacts from the local residents. You know, the big impacts that we hear about today are the temporary Roosevelt Bridge, uh, obviously the rock excavation at Kitchis or Kitchissippi Station, which is very close to some homes. Uh, and then kind of at the far end, uh, there's still some excavation happening kind of in and around people's homes and, you know, having to very tightly manage lights and lights pointing the wrong direction and things happening. We are cognizant of the impacts and we are trying to be very uh, responsive uh, when somebody kind of puts in, sh shines a, a construction light in the wrong direction by accident. We try to respond to that quickly. Um, but ideally, some of these really big impacts like rock excavation uh, will will kind of come to an end uh, in the in the near future. I, I appreciate that, and so do the residents. the The other um, concern is the um, is 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 routes for pedestrians. Um, when we make detours, um, we're you know it's usually about cars, and we have to make sure that we constantly think of pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, I appreciate that with the with the unfortunate delay of the pedestrian bridge up. up Woodruff uh, from Woodruff High School. That's that's caused uh, a lot of uh, inconvenience, but appreciate the work that was done to make a safe route uh, for residents. Unfortunately, um, on the on the north side of Carling, people are still walking on the, like in front of cars. Like it's terrible. Um, it, it's uh, it, it's really hard to get people to take a a very convoluted route. So I'm hoping that'll open soon, the north side of Carling um, near the station uh, for pedestrian uh, safety. Um, and uh, of course that is, you know, it's gonna be all about connectivity because people are gonna be walking to stations. We're gonna be, so um, I hope the conversations are going on with the NCC about uh, improving the routes and uh, those connections uh, to get to the station for pedestrians and cyclists. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, that uh, Carling is definitely a pinch point for us to, as we built that bridge, but we have completed the last deck pour on Carling Avenue. And so um, we, we are, should be able to very soon have line of sight on when we can kind of restore the, the original traffic patterns on Carling to, to make that one location safer. But there, you're right, there are a series of impacts. Kitchissippi Station has, some, has a challenging bus stop uh, that is right on one side of where we need to build a rock cut. Um, so there's, there's some spots that are, that are difficult. Obviously getting Woodruff Pedestrian Bridge back into, back into service will, will provide some relief to the community. I appreciate it very much. I'll let my colleagues ask questions now. Thank you. Great, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much. And Councillor Menard, congratulations on your election as well. Thank you uh, very much, Mayor. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks to staff for the presentation today. I um, appreciate getting an update. One of the uh, pieces that for me is important uh, relates to the, the confidence levels of when we launch stage two, because a number of pieces fall from that. So our, you know, Bronson Reconstruction, Carleton University Student Service, um, so are we confident in that August handover? I mean, I guess, what, what would you say your confidence level is in that August 2023 handover? Uh, and what, what might be the impediments to, to us achieving that date? Mr. Mayor, I would say that the, uh, you know, the August handover is still, you know, still a stretch target, still will require a lot of effort. There's a couple of, you know, and, and my confidence will build, I can't, it's hard to put a number to it today, but certainly it will build over time. If, uh, if they're able to complete the track, uh, the most, the majority, if not all of the ballasted track this fall, that will, that should give us some, some confidence that they will be able to start the signal testing in the spring. We've done some early, uh, signal testing with the Siemens train control system to try to flush out any issues, um, but they will, you know, start end-to-end -end testing uh, in the spring timeframe, so April, April, May. Right away, we'll, not, we'll have a pretty good sense of, you know, are there bugs, are there challenges, are there things that we need to kind of work out? Um, 
And so, you know, if the signal testing goes well, uh, right out of the gate, then I think that that'll give us additional confidence. And then the last couple of pieces are, you know, wanting to make sure that, uh, you know, training is 100%, that there's no, uh, there's no short, shortcuts to training for staff. You know, we are making some, like in the past, when we ran the Trillium line, we did the rail dispatch using a third party out of Montreal. And so now we brought the rail dispatch in house. I think it's an improved solution because our operators will have access to cameras and access to special constables and access to all kind of the tools at their finger, fingertips, but it is a new function. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's akin to what we did with the confed line. Uh, so wanting to make sure that's right. And then, you know, obviously we need uh, for this line, we need Transport Canada approval. Uh, in the form of a railway operating certificate, and we need uh, approval from the Canadian Transportation Agency in the, in the form of a certificate of fitness to run the service. So, uh, so there's some additional kind of hurdles to get through. Uh, but you know, we're working on all of those every day. And so, uh, if if we see an issue with either the track completion this fall or the start of a signal testing uh, in the spring, that'll tell us whether we have an issue or not with the August handover. That's very helpful. And I guess my preoccupation is just mitigation as, as we move along the, the Carlton coming back this September, you know, the expectation previously was we'd have that running. It's not, but we have uh, some, some loading issues. Maybe there's some positivity in that people want to take the bus again, but there's been real, real difficulties for students with the seven, the 10, the 11, the two. And so in the meantime, though, it may not be running, the train may not be running. We need to, I think, supplement service there. And I've raised it with Pat Scrimger as well around some of these bus crush loads that are happening um, for students who are, who utilize the U pass and a source of revenue for the city, even through pandemic times, uh, we need to make sure they're well, they're well served. So I just want to raise that those bus numbers are, are continue to be a challenge for students and, uh, We'd like to see some mitigation as a result of the the delay in in um, the the line launching. Uh, my last question is just around uh, a construction timeline for finishing and opening up the the ped bridge, the pedestrian bridge between Carleton and Vincent Massey. Um, I know my colleague Councillor Brockington has been working with staff, but when can we get an actual timeline for that? So when it will be open? It's been it's been put into place, and we were expecting sometime this this winter. But when can we just get the timeline on construction and when it will open? Yeah, so the, the Mr. Mayor, the remaining works on the uh, Rideau River pedestrian bridge include there's some civil works for the approaches, there's concrete works for the decking, and then there's electrical work. And right now, all those works are also those types of works and this type of craft are required on the main line. And so we've been prioritizing the main stations and the guideway. Uh, we are expecting them to restart that pedestrian bridge in the spring. And once they do that, we see kind of how, you know, their, their initial product production levels in terms of getting that work completed, then we'll be able to give a firmer date. But right now, um, you know, all, you know, all we've been able to say is that it's roughly a four month timeline and that they're going to restart that work in the spring. Okay. I just appreciate uh, a, a proper timeline for the construction outlook on this one when we get it uh, in the near future. So we can inform students, staff, staff, faculty, people that use that, that NCC path. Um, thanks very much uh, to staff for the presentation. Appreciate it very much, Mr. Morgan. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Brockington, and congratulations to you on re-election as well in River War. Thank you, thank you uh, Mr. Mayor, and good morning to you and colleagues. Um, I, too, appreciate the um, update from our staff on uh, this major infrastructure project, and I, I just want to ask first questions about timelines. Does staff believe that the original timelines and delivery dates of the Eastern Line, the Southern Line, and the Western Lines were realistic and doable to begin with? So, Mr. Mayor, for the East, uh, well, you know, we've seen that the team has been able to achieve uh, that timeline roughly, you know, it's a plus or minus, uh, you know, they're 36 delay day delay today, but largely they've achieved that timeline. And I think it's, you know, when we went to procurement, uh, all the teams came back with longer timelines on the Confederation line than were originally included in the reference design. And so uh, I think, you know, I think I think that was the market telling us what those timelines should be. I think, unfortunately, for the West, uh, there's been some challenges and there's been uh, some impacts due to a variety of things. Uh, you know, I don't don't want to spend uh, too much time on on those now. So, you know, absent other some of those impacts, you know, I think a year and a half is still a fairly su substantial delay uh, on the Trillium Line North South. 
you know, I think the volume of work that was included in that project, uh, if you look at the volume of rework that they've done on things like the Dow's Lake Tunnel, things like the Rideau River Pedestrian Bridge, um, you know, so, some of it could be down to uh, execution challenges. Is, was it an overly optimistic schedule? It's tough to say at this point. There's been too many kind of changes to the environment to, to know if, if that original schedule would have held true on the North-South line. Yeah, I ask because there'll be future phase of LRT and it's important that uh, when timelines are established, they they factor in all of the concerns. South, we knew there was going to be bridges built and, uh, and work in this regard. So it's important going forward that uh, we have that realistic timetable at the beginning. Um, you had mentioned uh, the Dow's Lake, you were showing the Dow's Lake work. And my understanding was when the tower that's going to be built that abuts Dow's Lake Station, the station is actually going to be partly embedded in that building. So can you just clarify when that tower is eventually built, will there be more station work done at Dow's Lake Station or has have those plans evolved and what's happening at Dow's Lake Station is what the station is going to look like in the future? Uh, so Dow's Lake, Dow's, so at Bayview Station, there is a pedestrian bridge that will connect to a future tower. At Dow's Lake Station, uh, the only thing that's in the plan is what what's being built now. There is a, you know, a scenario where in the future, one could come back and widen the guideway and do a double track platform. But today, uh, the only thing that's being built is that extended platform and the, the dual elevator bank. There's no, today, there's no connection to an adjacent tower. No, no, my understanding is that that block on the north side of Carling is going to uh, yield a number of towers, one of which is where the current car dealership is. There's no tower at all. With that tower in such close proximity to the station, my understanding, this is going back a number of years, similar to in downtown Toronto or Montreal, where st the station entrance and part of the station is actually in the building. Is that still in the plans? Or again, is what's being built at Dow's Lake the final look of that station? I mean, that's the final look for the station okay. uh, as part of this project. Okay, fair enough. The You made a comment about Walkley Station that when the two new condo towers that are being built at the southern end of this area are done, the MUP, did I hear you correctly, will then be extended to wrap around. And if that's true, will it stop at the Rio Can property line or will that be extended all the way to Bank Street, which is planned? Uh, I, my understanding is that the, uh, the developer is putting in a connection to Bank Street uh, on kind of at the southern end of that station. And so we're building a multi-use pathway that goes up the hill to connect with Walkley Road and that there's another new connection being built by the developer that connects to Bank. And, but is that under the same timelines of 2023? Uh, I, we reached out to the planning team the other day and they said 2023, yes. Excellent. And my last question is regarding Greenboro Station, staying in the south end. Um, will there be a connection between the western edge of Greenboro Station and the multi-use pathway, which is right beside the, the uh, Sawmill Creek pathway? Uh, today, there's no connection. And how feasible is that given that they're right beside each other? Uh, you would have to go under the station. I okay. Think, you know, the, it would be a bit of work. Fair enough. Okay. Um, obviously, I'm not <laughs> asking okay. for that to be done now, but there's um, that pathway is becoming more and more used. And um, that issue was raised certainly on the recent campaign trail and something that I'd like to chat with. OC at a future date. But again, thank you for the update on this very important uh, infrastructure project. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor <clears throat> Leeper, please. And congratulations to you as well on your you. win in Mississippi. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, with respect to the uh, post RSA uh, works that remain to be done, I'm wondering what the timeline is. So the, the West extension, we're looking at um, uh, you know, three quarters of the way through 2026. Obviously, that uh, 
timing is going to move around. That's a long way off. But the Churchill Scott intersection is problematic. There's a temporary transit way that runs parallel between um, uh, Kitchissippi Station and uh, and Churchill Avenue. There's um, uh, landscaping restitution to be done. What is the timeline for some of that post RSA service once the train starts running? I Mr. Mayor, I have to go back and look at the uh, the updated schedule to see how quickly they think they can do that work. Uh, you know, there's a couple of the, the Churchill Transitway connection is is a big one, obviously. The other big one is the uh, the restoration works um, basically between Iris Station and Lincoln Field Station. So the, kind of those are the two big projects that that are kind of post uh, opening, uh, largely because we need to turn off the buses to to and turn down that section of the bus network uh, once the LRT is in service. Um, so I'd have to follow up on the duration of those times, but I know that the uh, the contractor is eager to finish as much as possible before uh, before the end date. Like they're they're motivated to to finish the work quickly. It's not yeah. it shouldn't be a, a two year project to get that stuff done. Yeah, I mean that tra temporary transit way that runs parallel to the um, uh, the, the current trench. Uh, you know that needs to all be removed and turned into, and then the restoration of the uh, the Roosevelt pedestrian bridge would be part right. of those works as well, right? So we're very keen right. to get to uh, get that pedestrian bridge. Let me follow up with you offline to uh, see whether there's some insight into how long that might take because it is uh, important to the residents there. Uh, I do appreciate uh, your acknowledgement that the Bailey Bridge uh, continues needs to be problematic with respect to noise. Uh, my understanding is that uh, OC and Kev have done all the mitigation work that they believe they can do on it. Is Are there any other solutions um, not yet tried with respect to mitigating that noise? Uh, I get, I'd have to, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd have to follow up with the uh to answer the question, follow up with Kev to see if there's anything else, but we've tried, you know, added additional echo barriers. We want to take some noise measurements now that those are in place. Uh, there was a discussion this morning with transit operations about just kind of enforcement of the, the stop and start, the, the bus feeds over the bridge to minimize the noise. Uh, there were some additional things that Kev was working on to try to minimize it. I don't have to go back and see how effective they were, but uh, um, I think we're, we're almost to the end of what we can do, but you know, we'll, we'll keep looking for sure. Okay, I'll head out uh, sometime in the next couple of nights to uh, to give that a listen because my understanding is most of the mitigations are in place. Um, and it's it's unfortunate that a lot of expensive mitigation has had to be put in place. Um, if the buses stopped where they were supposed to stop uh, on a consistent basis, we, we wouldn't need that. So I would urge you to continue to work on enforcement measures with the drivers. Um, I don't think they understand necessarily the impact they're having when they... Um, don't uh, don't obey the the stop restrictions on the bridge um okay uh, and actually those are uh, those are my questions thank you very good uh, thank you councillor cavanaugh <clears throat> thank you um this question is about uh, the noise mitigation following uh, council leaper um for when the track the tracks are operating and the trains are operating um especially on curves um, the big concern is the one that is um, towards uh, Lincoln Field. Um, we've, we've talked about this before, um, and um, it's about lessons learned from stage one. And uh, what are we doing specifically to, to make sure that uh, the, we will not see repeat issues of, of noise on curbs? So, Mr. Mayor, on noise uh, in the West, there's a number of locations where we are putting in some uh, some mitigations. And so there are locations similar to what we did at Parkdale, uh, where we're putting in rail dampers. There's locations where we're putting in uh, a short noise wall. There's the option to put in rail dampers on those curves. Critically, in terms of the curves, though, we are working with RTG to look at uh, uh, how do we optimize the wheel rail interface to make sure that that location, we don't run into those challenges. It, primarily, it starts with the railhead condition and the wheel condition. Uh, and from there, you know, you're looking to mitigate. But if we can correct the issue at the source, uh, then or minimize the issue at the source, then that will make all the other mitigations even more effective. And so there is a there is a program that we are working with RTG to to 
to assess and understand and make sure that wheel rail interface is, is optimized. That would be the first thing. And then the second thing is we are through the through the project, the uh, infrastructure construction, we are putting in a series of mitigations to help uh, minimize the impacts for, for those locations where we are very close to some homes. I appreciate that. And of course, that we even have a condo building that's, you know, where we've got a, a very sharp curve. Um, what, uh, I guess the one concern was just the, the decibel level um, was not agreed upon. It just seemed that it was very high. Um, what is considered to be the acceptable decibel level? Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the, there are some challenges in respect of the decibel lev levels when you're going into neighborhoods as part of the kind of the transit no study noise assessments to understand what is the impact, uh, you know, in locations where you already have uh, a high impact due to local traffic. Um, the approach can be slightly different than areas where there's no kind of high background noise to, to begin with. And so we have been target, you know, trying to minimize the numbers, but there is a bit of a range depending on the location and depending on the proximity to the homes and the, the, the impact of the, um, the, the existing traffic levels. And so it's not an easy number. It's not, I can't put a number to it. Um, it's, it's one of the scenarios where we do a case by case analysis for each location, to understand what the impacts are in order to minimize the impacts at those locations. I appreciate and I expect we'll have uh, more community meetings uh, to discuss these in the future. Thank, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor. Councillor Alshantiri, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, uh, Michael, for your presentation. Uh, with all this, with some of the delay you talked about earlier, Michael, it, with the increase of cost, we all understand with the construction, with the cement, with the steel, with other, will that be still covered with the contingency we have set aside or there might be some call for additional funding to be able to complete the work? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, with, with the project delays generally, uh, you know, we're going to have to keep the city's oversight office open longer. And so there will be kind of a pressure on contingency for that. Uh, you know, we are have been working through all the lessons learned and the impacts and areas like noise mitigations where we want to kind of increase the the uh, the level of kind of control we have over the system. So those create impacts there. And, you know, and then generally we're seeing kind of, uh, as you do in most construction projects, as you get closer to the end, that's when the claims come in. And so, you know, you need to treat each of those as they come and potentially there will be some impact on contingency as a result of that as well. Do we have any idea at this time what, you know, with the contingency, how, you know, it's, it's additional cost or we don't have a clear number at this point? Uh, today, we don't have a clear number in terms of what the, the pressure would be. But, uh, and then in terms of the claims, we're happy to have that discussion uh, with legal counsel uh, and counsel, which I think is scheduled shortly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ray. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Counselor Hubley, please. <laughs> Congratulations, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just following up, uh, Michael, on that point, uh, the Ottawa Citizen recently uh, posted a story that said the uh, LRT phase one was a billion dollars over budget. Uh, you're talking about some contingency funds that would be used, but at this point, the project is or is not over budget. Um, Mr. Mayor, in terms of the stage one, project and the stage one budget, we did uh, request an increase of $15 million to the contingency fund uh, last year, uh, but, but we've not spent that amount yet. So there's still remaining funds in the stage one budget. So we're still on budget with the exception of that 15 million if we use it. Correct. Okay, thank you, Michael, for a clear answer on that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, that's uh, all I want to get on the record. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. So we'll, uh, excuse me, now head over to item 9.1, City Manager's Office, update on Ottawa Light Rail Transit Public Inquiry and recommended next steps. Mise à jour enquête publique sur le réseau de transport commun par train à gestion réel d'Ottawa. Uh, Councillor Dudas, um, if you would move the motion, please, so that we can deal with this item. 
Certainly. Uh, whereas the report titled Update on the Ottawa Light Rail Transit Public Inquiry and Recommended Next Steps was not originally listed on the agenda and was subsequently published with the revised agenda on Friday, October 28th, 2022, therefore it be resolved that FEDCO approved this item be formally added to the agenda pursuant to subsection 89.3 of the procedure bylaw, being bylaw number 2021-24 to allow for the consideration at this meeting. On the motion, carried, ad update. Uh, Mr. Kanalakis, I believe you have a uh, presentation. Uh, Mr. Mayor, no, we don't have a presentation. We're just available for questions. Leslie Donnelly is here as the uh, as a key contact for this report. Okay, my apologies. Uh, any questions on... Uh, the Donnelly report, we'll call it. <laughs> what can be said in five pages, Leslie says it in 500. <laughs> Anything, Councillor Gower, please? <clears throat> yes, um, I just had a question. There was a breakdown in the report of city costs to respond to the inquiry. And um, I wasn't sure how staff time was being accounted for or if it was included in that overall cost, because I know there's lots of hours uh, and many departments, uh, many levels of the city that have gone into this. Can staff provide some clarity on how that's being tracked and what the financial implications are there? Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, some staff's are are costs are captured. Many are not, they're being absorbed in other parts of the organization where I borrowed staff that needed to be backfilled. Those staff salary costs are uh, accounted within the four and a half million. The rest of them, such as my cost for me and the cost for most of the staff that I'm using, that's be being absorbed within budgets. Where we do have overtime is where we require significant amounts of overtime from IT staff to pull the records and do the document production. And that is all captured. Okay, thank you. That's what I was looking for. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Councilman Hart, please. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Mayor, and thank you for the report. I'm just wondering, can, can you just lay out for councillors the, the next steps on this? Uh, I, I guess we don't have an expected date of, of reporting yet, um, but maybe you do. <laughs> and. Uh, and just what, what will occur after in, in summary? Mr. Mayor, if committee and council adopt this report, well, I can say uh, it would be highly unusual for the commission to give us a heads up as to when they're dropping the report. Uh, they're not terribly forthcoming on that level to the participants. Uh, we expect that it will be by November 30th, but as the report notices is council will be in the middle of a transition. It's likely there won't be standing committees. So what this does is it really establishes a set of processes that will set the next council up to uh, do several things. So the first thing will be to prepare a companion report that will go to the appropriate standing committee with the commissioner's final report and recommendations to allow for public delegations and then to go through council. And the recommendation is for as soon as practicable because you want the new council to have the time and ability to set its own schedule and understand where it's going to the right committee and how that goes. The other thing is, as you know, governance is the first uh, report that the new council will deal with. Uh, Information management, records management is a standard governance instrument. So if the recommendations are approved, an approach to reviewing the records management bylaw, to seek guidance from the IPC on temporary records using instant messaging app, that process will be identified in the governance report and the next council will deal with it. The same is true with dealing with some of the uh, issues that we discovered going through uh, this inquiry process with respect to setting out some internal improvements to internal project governance and 
accommodating, allowing, discussing the uh, how council should be updated throughout the process. We have community stakeholder engagement, but we haven't laid that out in a formal way. So that will be going through part of uh, the city treasurer's review of the business case uh, approach, and we'll again come back to the new council. Uh, as for the LRT stuff, as you all know, this will be some 23rd or 24th of the hindsight reviews, third party reviews. Uh, that is an active file. There is ongoing third party monitoring and the companion report that comes with the LRT recommendations will be both talking about the rear view and updating council on what's gone on since. So that's, it is really very much a process report given the awkwardness of where we're at in the term of council and the commissioner's report. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor. Just last question around um, the delegation of, of authority. So <clears throat> just, just to give me a timeline of that, we've, we've given a lot of delegated authority over previously on this file. I suspect the new council may wish to take some of that back for reporting purposes and the public. What what would be the process for taking back some of that delegated authority within the new term of council? Would that come through governance or would that be another spot that, that would, would come as a result of um, the public inquiry that was required? I'm sure someone else may have something to say, but the vision was we would wait for the companion report, uh, uh, wait for the inquiry's recommendations, review the best practices, bring forward a companion report where it would be uh, accomplished through that process. That's how we had had a preliminary discussions. Okay, thank you very much. For the thank you very much. <clears throat> On the report as presented, adopte, carried. Uh, Councillor Dudas, you have a motion to go in camera. <clears throat> I do, Mr. Mayor. Um, where is the item titled? Oh, sorry. Yeah, where is the item titled Light Rail Transit Legal Update in camera? It was not originally listed on the agenda. It was published with the revised agenda on February, October 28, 2022. Therefore, it be resolved that FedCo approved this item be formally added to the agenda. Is this the right one? Sorry. I've got a several. Is this yeah, okay. I did the agenda pursuant to the subsection 89.3 of the procedure bylaw to allow for the consideration of this item at this meeting. On that motion, carried. Sure. And then uh, motion uh, by Councillor Dudas to um, a motion to go in camera, please, Councillor Dudas. Certainly. Be it resolved that the Finance and Economic Development Committee resolve in camera to receive and consider LRT legal update pursuant to the procedure bylaw, subsections 13.1e, litigation or potential litigation affecting the city, and 13.1f, the receiving of advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, reporting out date not to be reported at. Adopte, carried. carried. We'll now take a 10 minute <clears throat> break to allow members to leave the Zoom meeting and join the MS Teams meeting as well as to allow clerk staff to stop the Zoom meeting. So 11.15 uh, uh, will reconvene. And if anyone has any technical challenges, if they can contact our committee coordinator. So we'll be in recess for the next 10 minutes to 11.15. Thank you, merci. Okay, everyone, um, I understand we have quorum and we're, we're good to start proceeding. So we'll, we'll commence now. Um, and for the benefit of those joining us online, the FedCo committee just met in camera in order to receive a presentation on light rail transit from the legal 
perspective, these matters will not be reported out as they relate to subsections 13.1e of the procedure bylaw, litigation or potential litigation affecting the city, and 13.1f, the receiving of advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. During the in-camera session, no votes were taken other than procedure motions and or directions to staff. We will now move on to item 11, information previously distributed. And that is item 11.1, 2022-2026 election compliance audit committee appointment of members and update on compliance audit processes. Does anybody have any questions or wish to discuss that item? No. And item 11.2, economic development update, Q4 2021 and Q1 2022. Are both items received? Received. Excellent. Yeah. Item number 13, notices of motion for consideration at subsequent meeting. I don't believe we've received any. No. Uh, item 14, uh, inquiries. We don't have any of those either. Okay. Item 15. We have no other business. And item 16, adjournment. We so carry on adjournment. Carried. Carried. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. It looks lovely outside. Thank you.